All right, everybody. Ank Uja Sinem. That means life, health, and vitality. Hapu. That means peace. This is Shak and Ra Allah. And I'm going to be following up on a previous discussion that I had about the Egyptian hieroglyphics in the Olmec, Mayan, and Isthmian inscriptions. I subtitled this presentation as a part of a larger research that I'm doing regarding implications for Egyptology, African studies, and Black Indian genealogy. So if you missed the last video, make sure you go watch it because um, I'm just going to give an overview of my sources, which I do before every single presentation that I do. And then I'm going to continue to build on what we discussed last week. So these are my primary sources that I use to conduct this research, starting with Egyptian hieroglyphics and Olmec and Isthmian inscriptions, a comparative study of augmented symbols by Dean Clark. This work was very significant in my research because it helped me to see the correspondences between the Olmec system and the ancient Egyptian system, as well as symbology regarding the Olmec crowns and how that corresponds to the crowns of Kemet. What we're also going to be reading and focusing on today is Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx by Augustus Le Plongion as well as sacred mysteries among the Mayas and the Quiches, 11,500 years ago. Some of my other sources that I use to conduct this research include the African presence in ancient America, they came before Columbus by Ivan Van Sertima, as well as the first Americans were Africans by Dr. David Imhotep. So with all of that being said, let's pick up where we were last week. We, we started to talk about the <clears throat> the leopard skin priesthood of Osiris. And so we're going to build on that today and show you the significance of the leopard in Kemet, as well as here in the ancient Americas among the Olmecs and the Black Mayans. So what you're looking at here is a tomb painting of Nkeng Ai, who was clothed in leopard skin, which was a mantle of the priest. And this is a part of a larger ritual called the opening of the mouth or the Wep Wat ritual, all right? And on the right, again, we have a, a statue, I believe this is from the Ptolemaic period of a, a priest wearing a leper skin. And how do we know that he's an actual priest? There are several indications that this person is a priest, primarily his shaved head um, is an indication that he is a Shem priest and also the leper skin and how he's depicted lets us know that this was a priest from that time. So we will, again, be going over this ritual, this opening of the mouth ceremony, which was a ritual that can be seen in the Book of the Dead, the papyrus of Ani, and also right here in the Americas. And so this is from the Egyptian presence, I believe, from the Egyptian presence in America, B.C. The opening mouth ceremony is depicted in Mexico. Uh, with a wall painting, and this was taken inside a cave at Justa La Huaca. And there's a gigantic figure wearing lion skin or possibly leopard skin. You know, it just has spots on it. So we can argue that it's a lion skin, a leopard skin, a panther skin, or a jeopard skin. We do know that it is some, for, some form of feline skin. He is holding two ceremonial objects, which is similar to what's depicted here in Egypt before a kneeling man. Both priests wear skins of beasts whose tails hang between their legs. So focusing in on what's in between the legs here is that's also a primary indication that the person is a priest. In addition, they both proffer a snake headed instrument to the kneeling bearded man. This snake When I was reading this, I immediately thought about the serpent in Genesis because the serpent is the one that actually awakens Adam and Eve to knowledge of their true selves. And he asked them, is it really so that God said you must not eat from the tree? Rather, you will not die, but your eyes are bound to become open like God knowing good and evil. It's important to recognize the symbology of the serpent 
many people here who have become indoctrinated with Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they have a negative view of the serpent. All right. But the serpent is just a metaphor for an energy or for a consciousness. It, it has nothing to do with a devil or Satan. And you're going to go through this information just briefly. Um, this is just a recapitulation of what we discussed last week regarding the correspondences between the Micmac and ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs of similar form and meaning. So not only do they have similar forms, but they also have similar meanings. And this was research published over 50 years ago. So it's quite amazing that we still have, you know, these arguments in linguistics about Afro-Asiatic languages and where they come from, but there's been no relationship made as far as what I'm seeing between Mesoamerica and Africa. So with all of that being said, we also talked about the celebration of Osiris in Iowa and the Davenport Stele. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so I can break down to you guys what you're looking at. All right. You may be able to make out some of these symbols um, if you've seen some of my, pri my previous lectures before. Now, all the way here on the right, we have the sun, the rising sun, which is Ra. Here in the middle, we have the jet pillar of Osiris. Underneath the jet pillar, we have a ladder, which reminds one of the stairway of Mercury mentioned in the Book of Two Ways, and also Jacob's ladder in Genesis. And then we have right here the body. It looks like a deceased person right here, which will represent Osiris. And then we have other things such as uh, a metal reflecting a mirror and worshipers hauling ropes to raise the jet column so this is all about raising the deceased part of you the, the part within you that is osiris has to be raised otherwise it will remain dead so let's read this one more time just to uh, recapitulate this for presentation purposes the jet festival of osiris is celebrated in iowa sometime around 700 bc Explanation of the scene depicted on the Davenport steel, the hieroglyphs incorporated into the picture being here translated and also rendered in the former formal palace style. The jet column made of bundles of reeds encircled at the top by rings represents the backbone of Osir Osiris in whose honor the jet column was erected each year on the day of the spring equinox. This information originally obtained by Adolf Ehrman from a tomb inscription of the 18th dynasty in Thebes, Egypt, is here completely confirmed by the inscription and illustration of the Davenport Steel of Iowa. The mirror of reflecting metal shown to the left of the picture relates to the Egyptian text of the steel, which instructs the reader to attach a mirror to a column in such a way that the rays of the rising sun on the morning of the spring equinox will be reflected onto a signal stone called the watcher. And again, where have you heard about the watchers before? <clears throat> it reminds one of the book of Enoch, right? And the watchers. And for those of you who may be familiar with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, they have a magazine entitled The Watchtower, all right? So when you study masonry, you study these different secret societies like the Rosicrucians, you will see this term watcher quite often, but it originates, you know, with a much deeper spiritual system that you had to be initiated into to understand properly. This is just a translation of the Punic and the Iberian text of the Davenport Stilla from the Iowa Mounds, read from right to left. So we're not going to read it now, but I just want to show you guys that so you guys can get that visual in your head. Now, where was this Davenport calendar steel found? It was actually found in a burial mound in Iowa in 1874 by Reverend M. Gass, together with numerous other artifacts of North African and Iberian origin or relationship. This inscription is written in three languages. Egyptian hieroglyphics at the top, then Iberian Punic from right to left along the upper arc, and Libyan from right to left along the lower arc. 
This still can be found in the Putnam Museum in Davenport, Iowa, the repository of other priceless national treasures gathered by gas. And that's from the Mound Builders, published in 1892. So it was found in 1874. It's been in a museum and published and known in archaeology since 1892. So over 130 years ago, this was the Rosetta Stone moment of the United States of America. But the only Rosetta Stone that they liked about in college studies, Rosetta Stone that was found by Shannon. This is just a quick overview of the correspondences between the Maya hieratic alphabet, according to mural inscriptions, again, found in caves, found in burial mounds, and found in, in various artifacts right here in the United States or Central America, to be specific. Now, let's talk about the Mayan connection to the Black Jaguar or the Black Panther, the Ek Ba'alam. That's how I pronounce it. So in that word, Ba'alam, or Ba'alam, you may have heard the name of this particular deity before in the Book of Numbers. So I'm going to give you a quick synopsis of what happened in the Book of Numbers in the Hebrew Bible, and then I'm going to tell you the Mayan connection to the Black Panther or the Black Leopard. So there was a prophet in the Bible named Ba'alam, or Balaam, and he was a soothsayer. And basically a soothsayer is one who professes to tell the future. He is considered to be one of the seven Gentile prophets in the Jewish. So even though he was not a Jew, he still received the gift of prophecy and was able to receive messages from the God of the Old Testament, even in the book of Numbers. However, this name Balaam has a root with Baal. All right. And if you guys know anything about Baal, then you guys know God is really demonized and vilified in the Hebrew tradition. So even if you've never read anything about the Mayans and their gods, anybody that has read the Bible has already been subconsciously indoctrinated to view these gods or these characters or these metaphors for energy as demonic or ungodly. And that is basically what happens in the Bible. He was giving a prophecy about the future and the God of Israel admitted that he could be influenced by him to bring about the gift of prophecy through dreams. In the Bible, the king of Moab tried to hire Baalam to curse Israel so that the Moabites could defeat them in, ba in battle. So it's interesting that there's a connection between the Moabites and Baalam or Baal, because we know the original Moabites of the Bible were black people. So continuing, how does this connect to blackness and how does this connect to the Mayans. So let me share a different tab real quick. Let me stop sharing this one and go back here for a moment. So let's talk about Ek Balam or Ek Baalam. Scroll up a little bit. All right, I'm gonna drop the link to this article. It's from the Yucatan Times. It's a really good article. I encourage everybody to read it. But basically uh, what it talks about is where does the word jaguar come from? The word comes from the Gorani, Jacorete, Jaguar, and the suffix ete, which means beast of prey. The word entered English presumably via the Amazonian trade language Tupanimbaba. Rever revered by every tribe from the indigenous peoples of the United States. Key word. For some Native Americans, the word meant he who kills with one blow. And in the mythology of the pre-Columbian America, the black jaguar was widely seen as a god in Peru, Mexico, or Guatemala, to name a few. Mayans, Aztecs, Incas all worshiped the jaguar in every form. In the Mazalum of deities, the jaguar god was second only to the snake god in religious importance. At the temple of the jaguar in Chichen Itza, the Mayan king had to walk beneath a frieze of a procession of jaguars during a nation ceremony. It was an icon for the brave hunter and warrior who created military orders of jaguar soldiers. 
their members were the most valiant and highly acclaimed. God's kings, warriors, and priests added the Jaguar epithet to their names. All right. So now this is significant because just like in, in Kemet, everyone was considered an Osiris. The same thing is here in America because the Jaguar was represented as a manifestation of Osiris. So they added the Jaguar epithet to their names, Ba'alam, burnishing their reputations with a symbol of prestige and power. And only the most elite warriors and kings could use their black or spotted pelts. In Mayan mythology, the Jaguar was seen as one of the rulers of the Shibaba, which is the underworld, and as such, a symbol of the night sun and darkness. There were Mayan priests called Balam or Ba'alam who officiated at only the most important ceremonies. So what's key here is that the Jaguar is black and that it's a representation of the night sun, darkness, and it was seen as something sacred to all pre-indigenous peoples in the United States of America, as well as Central America and South America. So now that we've talked about that, let me go back to my slides real quick so I can follow that up with what we just talked about. So again, Balaam wasn't some demonic force or actual prophet in the Bible. I mean, he could have been, but there were many Balaams because it was a name attached to many priests. All right. So it's just very interesting that we see that that name in the Hebrew Bible. And the Hebrew Bible is set in what we now call the Middle East. And we've also seen other biblical names in the Mayan language, such as the name of Canaan, which I will talk about in my next video. So now I wanna talk about Papyrus Jumohak, which is a significant papyrus for many, many reasons. So let's talk about this papyrus. So the leopard skin rope, which we're showing, the leopard skin robe, excuse me, shown here on the left, is consistent with identifying this figure as a priest, specifically a class called the Shem priest. Now notice we just talked about how the black jaguar or Balaam was attached to the priesthood. And even to become a priest, uh, a priest would have to go through a ceremony with you know a bunch of jaguars and he would have to basically walk over these these jaguars and so we find the same thing in ancient kemet where a priest is recognizable by his leopard skin robe now this word shem is just an s and an m in hebrew it's the same thing it's just an s and an m and this is the son of noah or the father of the shemites all right so when they talk about people being anti-semitic they're talking about shem all right because they're they're basing this off of genesis Interestingly enough, and perhaps significant for Joseph Smith's interpretation of Fasima 1, the ritual clothing of this priest had a clear connection to the god Anubis. And isn't Anubis also known as the opener of the ways? And also, he is depicted as a black dog. Interesting. We're going to talk about that in a second. Now, he defeats chaos and evil, and he is personified as the god Seth through violence. Now, let's talk about the papyrus, which I'm showing you right here. Papyrus Jumilhak, dating to the Ptolemaic period, circa 300 BC, attempts to explain the significance of the leopard skin through a myth that relates the misdeeds of the god Seth. It's told in the papyrus, Seth attacked Osiris and then transformed himself into a leopard. The god Anubis, or Anpu, opener of the way, Wepawat, defeated Seth and then branded his pelt with spots. Hence, the robe commemorates the defeat of Seth. Also in Papyrus Jumilhak, Anubis transforms himself into a giant snake who brandishes two flint knives. So going back to the theme of the, the leopard skin, we see this all throughout Kemet, throughout all time periods from the Middle Kingdom, the New Kingdom, 
and even the Ptolemaic period and the late period. And so it doesn't matter what time period you go through in Kemet, the, the consistency in this mythology is clear that the leopard was viewed as something sacred because it represented overcoming the forces of entropy or set. So now that we've established that, I want to ask a question. Why is it important to recognize that Osiris is Lord of the perfect black? We have a lot of debate right now in several communities, even people here on this channel have accused me of appropriating Native American cultures. So whenever I get into those discussions, I always go back to the gods of these people reflects the characteristics of the people. So that is why it was important to recognize Osiris as the Lord of the perfect black. And like Noble Drew Ali said, peace to Noble Drew Ali, assalamu alaikum. He said, as man unfolds, his God unfolds. And so when we see here on the right, white Jesus, even though the Bible describes Jesus as having skin like copper and woolly hair, you know, like a sheep, he is still depicted as a lily, fair-skinned, uh, typical European phenotype throughout all the ages. And this, and this is across the board with all the characters of the Bible. In fact, I'm going to show you guys something real quick as an aside to just uh, bring this, this point home. So I'm going to show you guys a book that I was actually raised to read, something that I saw like all the time growing up. And this was actually one of the first books my mother actually read to me. And this is something that I, I read many times growing up. So let me stop sharing that book and share this one. So this is the uh, the my book of Bible stories. All right. And what's depicted here in this in this instance, I believe this is Pharaoh's daughter finding Moses on the Nile. Now notice the color of everybody depicted as the cover for this book. We have a, what appears to be a European baby, um, European child on the left, and you know maybe like you know some Middle Eastern style women, but very fair skinned, very fair skinned. No one is black in this book, is what I'm getting at. And uh, let's see if we can pull up some images of the first man and woman. First man and woman. Okay, yeah. And this is an image. I remember this like it was yesterday because I used to read this quite often as a kid and growing up. It was my first introduction to understand the Bible. But notice how everything in the Bible, the first man and woman, Jesus himself, Moses, Pharaoh's daughter, all the characters in the Bible, they're always depicted as white. All right, so uh, we don't have to continue to, to go through that, but I'm just showing you guys like every single story in the Bible, even the giants are always depicted as white, All right? There's never any depiction of blackness in the in anyone or any any religion, I should say, even Islam, I've seen pictures of Miriam and she's white. And even a religion like Islam will say, you know, we don't have any images of God because that's haram or it's it's against Islam to have images of, of, you know, prophets and stuff like that. But if you actually do the research on Islam, you will see that Islam at one time did have depictions of Muhammad and it was actually haram to show Muhammad as a black man and they kill people for doing so. So with all of that being said, I just wanted to establish, you know, that as a as man unfolds or as woman unfolds, his or her God unfolds. This is why we have to go back to who are these gods. We have to stop demonizing cultures that we don't understand and look at them for what they are showing us. And so what you're looking at here are some rules from the Mayans and depicting them in war and depicting them with leather or leopard skins. Here's another example of a depiction of the black Mayans with leopard skins. So this is always an indication that we are looking at priests, right? Even down to the symbol that this 
figure here all the way on the right is holding it looks like a shekim scepter or a shakim scepter which i can show you guys right now I'm familiar with it the hieroglyph for the shekim scepter is a ritual scepter in ancient egypt and it's actually my name i pronounce it differently um with an h but egyptologists have translated it as s-e-k-h-e-m and you can see here queen nefertari is holding this scepter in her hand as she plays a game of sinet and we see this symbol all throughout kemet and we also see the same symbol held um by the mayans and this symbol appears in the royal names of the pharaohs and later in the titles of the queens and princesses as well now let's go back to the slides real quick and then we'll read a little bit of queen mu and the egyptian sphinx so what we have here depicted is is so clear because you know you're going to hear people say that uh we are appropriating the mayan culture and that these are not our people right according to them but when we look at their gods they are black and even when we look at this this is a vase that you're looking at we have a black man very very black with leopard skin prints who's clearly a priest and a powerful man he is standing over what appears to be a red man so they the mayans drew clear distinctions between the red peoples and the black peoples and so we again we see these priests and you look at their robes and how beautiful and, and royal these black people are depicted um, even down to what they have around their their waists even down to their sandals and we see here that the red peoples are subjugated and bowing beneath the black peoples so you know no one can say that these people are not black because if they're telling you that that's a lie again um, we have here another brown ish color person i would say not really red but more so brown who also appears to have some form of of locks dreadlocks or some form of long firm long form braids and to the left we have a priest who again he's holding this figure which looks like a scepter and he is also wearing the leopard print and the animal leg is hanging in between his legs co covering his genitalia so the leopard skin in this instance is depicted in his crown um, on the robe that he's wearing as well as his footwear so everywhere we go we see the leopard and these look like black people all around from the hairstyle to the, the skin color the colors here are beautiful um and very very clear it's almost like this could have been painted today all right so now that we've read that i want to go back to um queen mu and the egyptian sphinx for a minute because there are some interesting tidbits in there that i wanted to cover so let's go ahead and pull that up now we're going to read a little bit of this so you can follow along with me i'm starting with the preface is this the first page yeah it is so it says here fleeing from the wrath of her brother Aak, queen mu directed her course toward the rising sun in the hope of finding shelter and some of the remnants of the land of mu as the story for instance failing to fall in love with such place of refuge as she was seeking she continued her journey eastward and at last reached the maya colonies that for many years have been established on the banks of the nile the settlers received her with open arms called her the little sister and proclaimed before leaving her mother country in the west she had caused to be erected not only a memorial hall to the memory of her brother husband but also a superb mausoleum in which were placed his remains and a statue representing him on the top of the monument was his totem a dying leopard with a human head a veritable sphinx so i'm gonna pause here because this is why the book is called and the Egypt Sphinx, because of this monument 
that um, the author excavated from Maya ruins, right? It was a dying leopard with a human head who looked like a sphinx. Let's continue. Once established in the land of her adoption, did she order the erection of another of his totems, again, a leopard with a human head to preserve his memory among her followers? The names inscribed on the base of the Egyptian Sphinx seem to suggest this conjecture. Through the ages, this Egyptian Sphinx has been the enigma of history. Has its solution at last been given by the ancient Maya archives? In the appendix are presented for the first time in modern ages, the cosmogonic notions of the ancient Mayas rediscovered by me. They will be found identical with those of other civilized nations of antiquity. In them are embodied many of the secret doctrines communicated in their initiations to the adepts in India, Chaldea, Egypt, and Samothracia, the origin of the worship of the cross, of that of the tree, and of the serpent introduced in India by the Nagas. Who raised such a magnificent temple in Cambodia in the city of Angar Thom to their god, the seven headed, the Ahak Shapat of the Mayas, and afterward carried its worship to the Akkad and to Babylon? In these cosmogonic notions, we also find the reason why the number 10 was held most sacred by all civilized nations of antiquity, and why the Mayas, who in their scheme of numeration adopted the decimal system, did not reckon by tens, but by fives and twenties. So the Mayas actually had a decimal system before we even had calculators. So that just shows you how advanced their, their system of knowledge had to be. Also, and why they use the 20 millionth part of half the meridian as standard of lineal measures. In the following pages, I simply offer to my readers the relation of certain facts I have learned from the sculptures, the monumental inscriptions carved on the walls of the ruined palaces of the Mayas, the record of which is likewise contained in such of their books as have reached us. I venture only such explanations as will make clear their identity with the conceptions on the same subjects of the wise men of India, Chaldea, Egypt, and Greece. I do not ask my readers to accept an a priori my own conclusions, but to follow the sound advice contained in the Indian saying quoted at the beginning of this preface. Verify by experience what you have learned. Then, and only then, form your own opinion informed hold fast to it although it may be contrary to your preconceived ideas in order to help in the verification of the facts herein presented i have illustrated this book with photographs taken to drawings and plans according to the actual careful surveys made by me of these monuments this is not a book of romance or imagination but a work of a series intended to give ancient America its proper place in the universal history of the world. I've been accused of promulgating notions of ancient America contrary to the opinion of men regarded as authorities on American archeology. span And so it is indeed. Mine is not the fault, however, and although it may be my misfortune, since it has surely entailed upon me their enmity and its consequences. But who are those pretended authorities? Certainly not the doctors and professors at the head of the universities and colleges in the United States. For not only do they know absolutely nothing of ancient American civilization, but judging from letters in my possession, the majority of them refuse to learn anything concerning it. And so this is nothing has changed in a hundred years nothing has changed if you go to an american university today are you going to learn about ancient america very little in fact even when you go to like african studies 
they always start with 1619, right? Or they start with Columbus's voyage to the Americas in 1492. Why do we always start history at these specific times, right? As if we don't have any records of anything prior to the arrival of Europeans in America. So he goes on to say, you know, it may be inquired on what ground can those who have published books on the subject in Europe or in the United States establish their claim to be regarded as authority? What do they know of the ancient Mayas, of their customs and manners, of their scientific or artistic attainments? Do they even understand the Maya language? Can they interpret one single sentence of the books in which the learning of the Maya sages, their cosmogonic, geographical, religious, and scientific attainments are recorded. From what source have they derived their pretended knowledge? Not from the writings of the Spanish chroniclers, surely. These only wrote of the natives as they found them at the time of and long after the conquest of America by their countrymen, whose fanatical priests destroyed by fire the only sources of information, the books and ancient records, Maya philosophers, and historians. Father Lopez de Cogayudo in his Historia de Yucatan frankly admits that in his time, no information could be obtained concerning the ancient histories of the Mayas. He says, and I'm quoting, of the peoples who first settled in this kingdom of Yucatan or their ancient history, I've been unable to obtain any other data than those which follow. The Spanish chroniclers do not give one reliable word about the manners and customs of the builders of the grand antique edifices that were objects of admiration to them as they are to modern travelers. The only answer of the natives to the inquiries of the Spaniards as to who the builders were invariably was, we do not know. And this is, this is something that we have to highlight because again, we have people that are confusing the so-called native people that Columbus encountered with the people that built these ancient structures. And these people came much later, much, much, and much later, the original black Americas. For fear of wounding the pride of the pseudo authorities, Shall the truth learn from the works of the Maya sages and the inscriptions carved on the walls of their deserted temples and palaces be with hell bro? Must the errors they propagate be allowed to stand and the propagators not be called upon to prove the truth of their statements? So-called learned men of our days are the first to oppose new ideas and the errors of these. This opposition will continue to exist into the arrogance and self-conceit of superficial learning that still hover within the walls of colleges and universities have completely vanished until the generality of intelligent men taking the trouble to think for themselves cease to accept as implicit truth the ipsy dixit of any quantum who pretending to know all about a certain subject pronounces magisterially upon it until intelligent men no longer block follow blindly such self-appointed teachers, always keeping in mind that to accept any authority as final and to dispense with the necessity of independent investigation is destructive of all progress. For as Dr. Paley says, there is a principle which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. This principle is contempt prior to a nation. So I love the preface of this book because it's so true, um, the bias that we have, and he really elucidates this and, and really puts it into perspective. What it was like, you know, 130 something years ago, being an archeologist stumbling upon this knowledge. So I wanna read a little bit about some of the book, and then um, if you guys have any questions, you can leave them in the, in the chat room or otherwise I'll cut it a little bit short. So, hold on one second.
keep going, not this page, but I think it's the next one. Our computer is super slow today. Okay. Now let's talk about this, this symbol right here. So this symbol that you're looking at, immediately, what do you notice when you see it? You may see a cross. I see a cross in the middle. I see a circle within a circle. I also see what appears to be a star. And I see what appears to be a two-headed snake, right? Which looks like the, the sun bark when I see it. So let's read a little bit of what he has to say about these symbols. The ancient armorial esquiton of the country still exists on the western facade of the sanctuary at Ukmal and in the bas reefs reliefs carved on the memorial monument of Prince Ko at Chichen. The emblem represented on said esquiton scarcely needs explanation. It is easily read Ulumil King, Land of the Sun. The kings of Mayak like those of Egypt, Chaldea, India, China, Peru, took upon themselves the title of the children of the sun and in a boasting spirit, that of the strong, the vigorous sun. King is the Maya word for sun, but kin is also the title of the high priest of the sun. As in Egypt and many other civilized nations, so in Mayak, the king was at the same time chief of the state and of the religion as in our times, the queen in England, the Jar, the Sultan in Turkey, etc. The title Yak King may therefore have been applied among the Mayas to the king and the kingdom. So that's just showing the universality of the sun and how it's always been shown in symbology. Um, going back to another symbol i want to show you guys some correspondences that you'll see here Let me keep going keep going not that one Okay, here we go. Now look at this symbol. So we're now talking about the interpretation of the symbol with, and we're analyzing this character right here. And Alanda tells us that among the Maya writers, this symbol that we're looking at stands for Ma, me, or who. Some will-be critics among the Americanists, our contemporaries, have accused the Bishop of Ignorance regarding the writing system of the Mayas. So what does this symbol mean and why is it significant? Because if we look at it and we say that it means Ma, we might be able to find a correspondence in the Medu Netcher for this symbol. In addition, <clears throat> why is it that this word Ake or Aki is also translated as Aleph of the Hebrews? And it says it right here. Perhaps Mr. Champollion's Le Joanne will be branded in like manner because he tells us that the Egyptians represented indifferently the vowels A, E, I, E, I, O, and E by their character right here. And this is what he's saying right here. He's saying the leaf or the feather was a homophone to mean an I, an A, an E, or an O. And this is the same correspondence that Champollion makes with the Hebrews, Aleph. So do we find in the Egyptian tongue written with Coptic letters, a dialect that uses indifferent, indifferently A for O, where the other two write O only, and where the other two write A? And he's saying, yes, we have seen this before in different dialects. Continuing. And this is my last point, is just to show the correspondence of the word ma and the word mu. So the symbol that I showed you previously, again, is, is shown here again. We have found that in remote times, ma was the meaning of this character. 
Let us try to analyze its component parts in relation to the name Mayak and its origin as an alphabetic character. It is easy to see that it is composed of the geometrical figure flanked on each side by the symbol Emik. Who can fail to see that this figure bears a striking resemblance to the Egyptian sign Ma that Dr. Young translates Ma and Mr. Champollion asserts to be simply the letter M. By a strange coincidence, if coincidence there be, the meaning of the syllable Ma is the same in Maya and Egyptian. That is, in both languages, it signifies earth or place. The word place or site, says Mr. Champollion, of the Greek text of the Rosetta inscription is expressed in the hieroglyphic part of the tablet by an owl for M and the extended arm for A, which gives the Coptic word ma, which is a site and a place. Now, I love this research because it combines the Coptic, the knowledge that we have of Coptic, and it compares what's on the Rosetta Stone with the Greek and it corresponds it with the Mayan symbols. So we are literally doing linguistics one-on-one, -on -one. but this is not done in most African studies or most um, linguistic studies or even your typical Greek class, because I took, took a Greek class before, and there's many different variations of Greek, but the Rosetta Stone is clear that this symbol means ma. Now, we see that in the Troanos MS, the author represented the earth by the figure of an old man, the grandfather, mom, hence by the Okape Ma, earth, site, country, place. Ma in the Maya is also a particle used as in the Greek language in affirmation or negation, according to its position before or after the verb. Another curious coincidence worthy of notice is that the sign of negation is absolutely the same for the Mayas as for the Egyptians. So literally the, the symbol that we use to negate a word is the same in both languages. That's, a, that's an amazing coincidence. So how many coincidences you know, do we have to go through before we say, okay, there's something more to this language? Bunsen says that the latter called it Nen, that word in Maya means mirror, and Nen Ha, the mirror of water, was anciently one of the names of the Mexican Gulf. This also may be a coincidence. No one has ever told us why the learned hierogrammatists of Egypt gave to the sign the value of Ma. No one can because nobody knows the origin of the Egyptians, of their civilizations, nor the country where it grew from empathy. They themselves, though, invariably pointed toward the setting sun when questioned concerning the fatherland of their ancestors, were ignorant of who they were and whence they came, nor did they know who was the inventor of the alphabet. Quoting the Egyptians who no doubt had forgotten or had never known the name of the inventor of their phonetic signs, at the time of Plato honored it with one of their gods of the second order, Thoth, who likewise was held as the father of all sciences and arts it is evident that we can learn nothing from the egyptians of the motives that prompted the inventor of their alphabetical characters to select that peculiar figure to represent the letter m initial of their word ma the mayas we are informed made use of the identical sign and ascribed to it the same signification we may perhaps find out from them the reasons that induced their learned men to choose this strange geometrical figure as part of their symbol for Ma, radical of Mayak, name of the peninsula of Yucatan. But that the same cause which prompted them to adopt it, suggested it also to the mind of the Egyptian hierogrammatist. Many will no doubt object that this may all be pure coincidence. The two peoples lived so far apart. So let's stop there because I think we covered enough for this particular video. But um, yeah, this this name Ma is very interesting to me because, you know, that's one of the first words a baby says. So there's so much that you can take from that. But I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that information.
Um, Bernice said it looks like the ovaries. Now, that's a correspondence that I've never made before. Let me look at it again now that you said that. Okay, so Bernice, this symbol that we're looking at here looks like the ovaries. Interesting. Or are you it's like the uh, fallopian tubes? Now, that's interesting. You know, that's definitely something that I would add to my research. Are you recognizing the end of Kali Yuga? We have transitioned from Western civilization. We are free without fear. And we have now entered the golden age of Aquarius. Yes, I do recognize that um, Kali Yuga was the age of darkness. And now we are at a time where the, the truth can no longer be hidden. You know, so this is why we live in a unique time with the Internet and um, social media and stuff like that. We're able to. Far apart. So, yeah, that's just very, very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff. One of the biggest times in history. Absolutely. So I hope you got this. Um, make sure you have a comment if you're catching the replay. Let me know what you think. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Peace.